Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Thoreau, and I'm the president of the Independent Institute. I want to welcome you to the second of our two live stream panel forums to respond to the Global Climate Action Forum in San Francisco. We're delighted to be partnering with the Heartland Institute, and this forum is being held here at the Independent Institute's Conference Center in Oakland, California. Leading this second panel is again James Taylor, Senior Fellow for Environment and Energy Policy at the Heartland Institute. James studied atmospheric science at Dartmouth College and received his JD from Syracuse University. He's a regular columnist at Forbes, and he's appeared at CNN, Fox News Channel, MSNBC, PBS, CB CBS, ABC, and elsewhere. <clears throat> Excuse me, and as many articles have appeared in newspapers across the United States. Thank you for joining with us, James. Thank you so much, David. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, and I feel even more strongly today, uh, it, it truly has been a pleasure being here at the Independent Institute in Oakland, California. Uh, the hospitality of you and your staff have been amazing. And, uh, and, and the more that I'm here, the more I learn about the Independent Institute. I see on the table uh, several uh, books on energy and environment topics that you've published. And that's just one of the many endeavors that the Independent Institute pursues. Uh, you truly are a, an amazing contribution to the cause of human freedom and liberty and, and human welfare as a whole. So thank you for having us here. It's truly a pleasure. I hope we can work together uh, closely in the future. Uh, once again, we are here to provide a rebuttal for the Global Climate Action Summit. Uh, this has been planned for the past year by Governor Jerry Brown in California here in the San Francisco Bay Area. This is supposed to be their uh, showpiece to, I guess, uh, serve in contradiction to President Donald Trump, his decision to pull out of the Paris Agreement and uh, Trump's uh, climate policies in general. So it's interesting to compare and contrast what is and isn't happening, what is and isn't being presented scientifically at the Global Climate Action Summit. And then I invite you to compare it to what we are presenting here today and make up your own minds. So once again, we have a panel of scientists and uh, climate policy experts that will be participating in the panel. From camera left to right, we have Tom Harris. He is the president of the International Climate Science Coalition. He's an engineer. He is well-versed on a wide variety of climate science topics. Uh, next to him, we have Dr. Richard Keene. Dr. Keene is an emeritus instructor in meteorology and climate science at the University of Colorado. Next to him, we have uh, Dr. Stanley uh, Goldenberg, who is a meteorologist in Miami. Besides being a meteorologist, uh, he is one of the scientists who goes on board airplanes uh, that fly into hurricanes to measure wind speed and other hurricane characteristics. Uh, so uh, Stan uh, has many interesting stories to tell. I don't know if we'll get to them because we want to talk about the science today. But look him up on, uh, on an Internet search and look up some of the videos he's done, not just about his flying into uh, hurricanes, but his personal experience uh, undergoing Hurricane Andrew, I believe it was, which struck uh, his home in Homestead, is it? Nope, just near Miami, in Miami. Right, Bryan area, Bryan, right. Florida. All right. And next to him, we have Dr. Terry Gannon. He is a research fellow here at the Independent Institute. He has a scientific background in device physics. He also studies climate science. Uh, on my right is Dr. Jay Lair. He is the science director at the Heartland Institute. He received the first PhD in the nation in groundwater hydrology. So in addition to being well-versed on climate change and related matters, uh, oftentimes the discussion uh, goes into drought and precipitation and uh, water availability. Jay Lair is quite the expert on that topic. And I am James Taylor. I am Senior Fellow at the Heartland Institute. So before we get into a discussion on particular scientific topics, after all, this is the point of this panel yesterday and today is to provide the science uh, that supports the skeptic, and I like to call it the realist cause, regarding global warming. Uh, but before we get into that, I think it's worth noting what has and hasn't occurred at the Global Climate Action Summit down the road uh, at the Moscone Center uh, in San Francisco. What we see is no science whatsoever. This is their opportunity. This has been billed as their signature event to oppose President Donald Trump's decision to pull out of the Paris Agreement. This is their signature event to present the case for their climate alarmism. 
And yet, if you watch, if you have been watching their summit, if not, if you're able to go back to an archive, watch it. I encourage you to. I would encourage you if they presented science, but I especially encourage you to watch it because they present no science whatsoever. And this is a case across the board. Time and time again, when you ask the people who claim that there is no scientific dispute, that there is no reasonable conversation that can be had, and you ask them to discuss the science, they say, I don't want to discuss the science. I won't discuss the science. There's a reason. Because the scientific evidence is strongly in support of skeptics and realists who recognize that climate change occurs, who recognize that humans may, may play some role in it, but who are justifiably skeptical of the alarmist uh, claims about some ap apocalyptic climate uh, catastrophe that they say is always imminently to occur. Look at the lineup of speakers at the Global Climate Action Summit. This is not a unified uh, group of people across various political parties and ideologies. Their speakers are Nancy Pelosi, Al Gore, John Kerry, John Podesta, Van Jones, even Alec Baldwin, Harrison Ford, and celebrity leftists. This is the who's who of the political left that has always sought to transform American society, to take away individual freedom, to destroy free market economics. And now they are utilizing, they are parasitically utilizing a supposed global warming crisis as a means to their end of centralized government and taking away economic and other individual freedoms. Look at their lineup of speakers. That's all you need to know. Although that's all you need to know, we invite you to listen to what they have to say because there's nothing to it. John Kerry this morning trashed, lectured, and chastised President Donald Trump and claimed that Donald Trump has no science backing up his decision to pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement. Well, John Kerry, here's your science. It's here on this panel. We're presenting at the same time as the Global Climate Action Summit where you present no science. We presented it yesterday. We'll present it today. And we'll only touch the tip of the iceberg because there's so much scientific evidence supporting the skeptic slash realist position. I invite you to go to the Climate Change Reconsidered website to look at Climate Change Reconsidered, which is a multiple hundred page volume summary of the scientific evidence with literally thousands of citations to objective data and peer-reviewed studies. The scientific evidence is there. You may pretend it doesn't exist, but it's there. That is what President Donald Trump has relied upon. That is what we are presenting today. I challenge you to present any similar such, such scientific evidence. Call out your champion. Bring them here. Let's have a discussion. Let's have a debate. Any one of them, I'll debate publicly, and any competent skeptic, and there are quite a few, would be happy to do the same. And the reason why John Kerry and Al Gore will never do so, and always balk at doing so, is because they know they cannot win on the scientific evidence. It's all about building the illusion of some scientific consensus, and we'll touch on that later, and avoiding the discussion of the science itself. After all, what this is all about is an ideology and a global governance agenda. This is what they've always been looking for. This is their means to the end, is global warming. Al Gore said... Here at the Global Climate Action Summit, here's what he said. I believe that was this morning. Quote, excuse me, it was yesterday. We have to make the decarbonization of the global economy the central organizing principle of civilization. End quote. That tells you everything you need to know. What Al Gore wants is a central organization of civilization. He doesn't want uh, individual freedom. He doesn't want economic freedom. He doesn't want people pursuing their own, end, their own ends or even nations looking out for their own interests. He wants a central organizing principle for civilization. And that's the reason why at the Global Climate Action Summit, their speakers are Van Jones. Their speakers are Nancy Pelosi. Their speakers are Al Gore. Their speakers are John Podesta. Because it's about the ideology and it's about their ulterior motives that have nothing to do with the science. But when it comes to science, I will note one development that I found very encouraging. Yesterday, the National Science Teachers Association, they issued a statement, and it's, it's pretty funny because I think their statement was perhaps intending to contradict skeptics, but they ultimately contradicted their own uh, views and their own agenda. And, and here's, here's what their statement said. Their statement said that teachers, science teachers in particular, must stand up 
for existing imperial evidence and make sure that climate change theories and arguments are not only supported by, imperial, by existing empirical evidence, but also by empirical testing. We at the Heartland Institute, at the Independent Institute, and across the skeptic universe could not agree more. And that's the difference between climate skeptics and climate alarmists. If you shine a light on their scientific claims, if you present data and arguments to test them, they call you anti-science. They say you're attacking science because you're engaging in the scientific method. But here we have the National Science Teachers Association themselves saying, any theories must stand up to empirical evidence and empirical testing. It is crucial, not just in the climate change debate, but in all scientific matters, that the scientific method is adhered to. That when a theory is proposed, that it be vigorously challenged. It should be challenged at first by those who present it, but those who present the theory should welcome challenges from other scientists and other experts. That's what we're doing here today. So with that uh, introduction, it maybe went a little more lengthy than I'd hoped, but there's so much going on at the Global, at the global Climate Action Summit that needs a rebuttal in terms of their ideology that it must be addressed. But let's, let's go back to yesterday. We opened the panel with a discussion of hurricanes. Hurricane Florence, uh, as we prepared for this, uh, this rebuttal, was a Category 4 hurricane. Uh, the Washington Post uh, said that Donald Trump was complicit in Hurricane Florence and it being a Category 4 hurricane. It came ashore as a Category 1 hurricane, uh, still very devastating. All hurricanes and, and tropical storms are very serious events, and not to diminish uh, the threats and the real damage being done, but certainly uh, the political hay that was being made by alarmists that this was a Category 4 hurricane is now Category 1. I'm wondering if President Trump is complicit in the reduction of, uh, of Hurricane Florence. But I'd like to turn this over, first of all, to, to Stan with your hurricane expertise. If you can just give us a little uh, update uh, over the past 24 hours and how that relates climatologically. Okay, first of all, let me uh, correct. It's not Dr. Goldenberg, sadly, yes. uh, but a uh, master's degree from Florida State. I'll say that. And, uh, and also, I want to state, by the way, I'm here on my own time. I, I consider this so important. Uh, I don't represent the views of my employer. These are my own personal, personal views, but I consider this important enough to take time to share with something like this. Uh, as far as Hurricane Florence, uh, it hit land as, I believe, a Cat 1. Uh, the Hurricane Center sometimes has to come up with the final statement when it, what it officially was. But they can see even a Category 1 or a strong Category 1, tremendous, tremendous damage uh, due to wind, due to uh, storm surge, due to flooding. And, um, and if it had been a Cat 4, if it hit a Cat 4 as a Cat 4, uh, wherever it would have hit would have been total devastation. It would have been a much higher degree uh, of damage. But still we have, have that. And it's very interesting to tie it climatologically, first of all, to the whole overall picture of what we're talking about. About five days ago, six days ago, we were looking at the forecast, and here was basically predicting Category 4 storm to hit the coast. And, uh, and I, met, I mentioned yesterday quickly, someone asked me, well, what's Florence going to do? And I said, well, we don't know what it's going to do. We just have the predictions and the forecast with a certain amount of air. And, and as far as the global models and the climate models, they don't know what's going to happen 25 or 50 years from now. They barely know what's going to happen one year from now. <laughs> Let me state clearly that in my job, we constantly are looking at several month predictions of the climate, of what's going to happen, and you would be surprised to find out how many times those are wrong. Uh, they're not totally reliable. They're helpful, but they're not totally reliable. And there's a, by the way, there's an old saying by uh, Thomas Huxley. I just wanted to say this. The great tragedy of science, the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. And you can have your hypothesis, you can have your theories, and they had a theory about man-made global warming. They had a theory about how it's going to affect hurricane activity. But when we started to look at the facts, those theories collapse like a pack of cards, and sadly, some people don't want to accept that. Um, as far as Florence, it's no surprise. It's no surprise we're having a fairly busy hurricane season right now. Frankly, I think some of the people at the summit act like that we haven't had hurricanes before. Every time there's a bad one, they say, oh my goodness, what's happening, and we're causing this, and it's going to get worse and worse, and it's like, no, you're going to keep having hurricanes. But I don't know if I kind of answered your question, but... Uh, Leave it back to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Stan. One of the <laughs> assertions that has been made in the media and by environmental activist groups and at the Global Climate Action Summit during the past couple of days 
tying in Hurricane Florence is the assertion that global warming is taking lives, uh, that President Trump and others who oppose costly measures to restrict carbon dioxide emissions are killing people. And also, we often hear about how global warming is making people sick. So I think this is one of the scientific topics is important to address uh, with our panel here today. So let me start with Dr. Lair, and others certainly uh, feel free to uh, provide some uh, perspective as well. But is global warming killing people? Is global warming making people sick? What are the negative or positive health and mortality consequences of more atmospheric carbon dioxide and modestly warming temperatures? It is so ridiculous uh, that these people uh, turn the truth upside down that warming is a, uh, is a bad thing. Uh, we know medically that nine times more people uh, die prematurely from excessive cold uh, than die prematurely from uh, excessive heat. We also know that temperature has very little to do with the spread of disease. Uh, so we can say with uh, total accuracy that if the earth is to warm, it is not a negative impact on human health. If anything, uh, it is a, a positive impact. I mean, it's just an anecdote. But as we know, most people vacation to the south rather than to the north. People like warm weather and uh, warm weather is good for you. Cold is, uh, is generally not. So the, these people are absolutely... Uh, taking reality and turning it upside down. Uh, it conjures up to me uh, a memory of the 17th century when we burned witches because we thought uh, they were responsible for uh, crop failures or many centuries before that when we actually thought uh, the earth was flat. Uh, I don't exactly understand why this uh, group of alarmists from all over and all walks of life have gathered together to... Uh, tell falsehoods that are virtually 180 degrees uh, from the truth. Uh, but that is the fact, and uh, James said it uh, brilliantly in the opening. In fact, I hope somebody at the Heartland Institute will transcribe uh, his opening and send it out as is as an editorial of newspapers across the country because he captured the essence of this absolutely uh, ridiculous uh, summit that's going on. I was uh, down near the summit uh, last evening and in front of the Embarcadero, a very famous area in San Francisco, is uh, a, a sculpture made out of uh, cardboard of a 15-foot high polar bear uh, <laughs> that is the icon for uh, global warming. And uh, yesterday and maybe today again there, they hunted out a very sick uh, polar bear, very scrawny, and uh, now are saying that that's what's happening because of global warming. The facts of the matter are that in 1960, uh, we knew we had about uh, five to 6,000 polar bears in the, uh, in the Arctic uh, area, and uh, we know today there are 25,000. So civilization and everything that's gone on with uh, uh, climate, the polar bear has uh, prospered, and yet they're uh, it, it's unconscionable that they would seek out a, a single diseased polar bear and say that is what global warming is doing or that they would uh, say that it has anything to do with the, uh, the hurricane you, uh, you heard of. But uh, how these people can sleep at night telling unconscionable lies, which they, they know must be lies, and, and they're doing it, as James said in the opening, uh, it's all about uh, growing the government, uh, controlling life on Earth, and they are talking about decarbonization, and decarbonization uh, really is the idea of, of killing all life on Earth because there is no life without carbon dioxide. Okay, and, and certainly anybody else feel free to weigh in, and, and I would just like to amplify Dr. Lair's comments a little bit. When, when Dr. Lair mentioned that nine times more people die as a result of cold temperatures uh, than warm temperatures, Dr. Lair is referring to a study that was published in The Lancet in 2015. The Lancet is probably the world's foremost peer-reviewed medical journal. And the authors of that study examined mortality worldwide. And what they discovered was amazing. They discovered that 7% of global deaths each year are caused by suboptimum temperatures and that this when they looked at those suboptimum temperatures 
90 plus percent of those deaths were as a result of cold temperatures rather than warm temperatures. On top of that, it wasn't from some sudden cold event that the global warming alarmists like to blame, ironically enough, on global warming. The vast majority of those deaths that were related to cold, that were caused by cold temperatures, were as a result of persistent, not sudden cold shocks, not sudden cold waves, but persistent, moderately cold temperatures. And those are exactly the type of temperatures that a warming climate diminishes the impact of, the, the frequency and impact of. To the extent that human emissions of carbon dioxide may be impacting the climate, if they are indeed causing the warming uh, that, we've, uh, that we've witnessed, or some of it, what it is doing is it is mitigating those 3.5 million deaths every year that are caused by cold temperatures. Think about that. 3.5 million people every year are dying as a result of cold temperatures, and very few are dying as a result of warm temperatures. If the planet continues its warming to whatever extent it's caused by human and or natural forces, that warming is saving lives. One of the reasons for this, people talk about at the Global Climate Action Summit, we heard a lot about dengue fever and yellow fever and, and others. Um, sure, there are some deaths uh, uh, worldwide according to that. Uh, the tie to climate is often tenuous or non-existent at all. But what they often don't talk about, for example, influenza. Influenza kills 500,000 people every year. And influenza, the strength of the influenza virus, is dependent upon cold temperatures. A warmer climate reduces the strength and the impact of influenza. And we see this in the actual mortality statistics, not just the Lancet study, but the U.S. Centers for Disease Control report that 800 more people die every single day in the United States during the cold winter months than during warmer months. Again, we see by data it's easy for the alarmist to take uh, anecdotes or to speculate without scientific evidence. But when you look at the evidence, when you do what the National Science Teachers Association says we must do, and that's test theories against empirical evidence, the empirical evidence shows that in terms of human health and human mortality, a warmer planet is a healthier planet for human civilization and promotes longer-lasting human life and reduces premature climate-related deaths. Yeah. Yeah, one of the claims of the global warming community is that with a warmer planet, tropical diseases would spread to higher latitudes. Well, I would ask him how to explain events like the yellow fever outbreak in Philadelphia in 1790, which killed one in nine people in Philadelphia, which was then the largest city in the United States, or the malaria outbreaks in Finland and St. Petersburg, Florida, over 100 years ago, and also the greatest disease outbreak of all time, which would be the Black Plague, which occurred during a cool period after a medieval maximum. That was in the 12 and 1300s when the climate was cooling. So as kind of the resident climate historian here, I would throw out those tidbits that really put a gabosh on the claim that a warmer planet is bad. I can just add one quick thing here. If people look up the National Vital Statistics System for the United States, they can see a 10-year plot of mortalities due to excessive heat, and there has been no increase. So you can check it out yourself, the National Vital Statistics System for the U.S. I think the other thing that we should talk about also is the greening of the world. Uh, the increased CO2 has increased the amount of vegetation on the world to add an area equivalent to the size of the continental United States. Crop yields are going up. Uh, certainly, general prosperity is going up in various places. So I think the idea of illness and uh, famine and drought and all things that are being increased fires, we've talked about some of these. Perhaps we'll cover others. But the, the, the gist of it is the increased CO2 is fertilizing plants. Uh, this is a very important part of our, our existence here on Earth. Yeah, maybe. Go right ahead. Yeah, along that line, um, at uh, agriculture supply stores, if you may call that that, and I'm from Colorado where agriculture has changed in the past few years, and lots of people have greenhouses, and one of the accessories has become quite popular are carbon dioxide generators to put carbon dioxide into the greenhouses raise them well above 350 or 400 parts per million, increase the amount by 10 times or more. So the greenhouse has the effect of one, warming 
the inside and increasing the carbon dioxide, both of which are good for plant, plant growth. And then curiously, there were some complaints about, oh, about 10 years ago when it was noted that more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere does seem to be greening the earth. So they, somebody wrote a paper saying, well, what plant is experiencing the greatest growth? Well, they didn't pick tomatoes or asparagus or, you know, anything edible or anything delightful. They said there's more poison ivy. <laughs> you know, of all the plants, they chose to do a paper about poison ivy and how there'd be more poison ivy with more carbon dioxide. They, Never mind the fact that tomatoes are bigger and plumper, too. I'd like to direct people to Biological Impacts, which is one of the non-governmental International Panel on Climate Change uh, uh, reports at climatechangereconsidered.org. If you click on Biological Impacts, you can see the biological impacts of increasing crop yield and all sorts of things because of CO2. The other website that people should go to is co2science.org, which is Craig Itzu's work. They've done a lot of studies showing how plants increase their growth rate, they need less water. So CO2 rise in the atmosphere from that point of view is a very good thing, and we should hope it continues to feed the billions of people who have yet to be born uh, by increasing crop productivity. I want to repeat something I said uh, yesterday, because uh, if you're watching the Climate Summit or reading uh, anything about uh, climate change, you're always reading about carbon and, and reducing carbon emissions. Uh, they use the word carbon when, in fact, they're talking about carbon dioxide. But if they used carbon dioxide, people would realize, well, that's the uh, odorless, uh, colorless gas that we all exhale. It's the gas that keeps vegetation alive. And so uh, that doesn't conjure up a, a, any negative thoughts. But by using the word carbon, carbon relate, uh, uh, people relate it to uh, to soot, to <clears throat> excuse me, coal dust, uh, carbon black. It's a negative uh, word, and they use it purposely to make people think negatively. So when you see the word carbon, uh, interchange it with carbon dioxide because that's what they're really talking about, but they don't want you to know it. Yeah, let me uh, let me mention something here. One of the questions is posted online. I wish we could get to all these. There's a lot of comments from Sean. Is Ellen Musk said recently doesn't know any serious scientists that don't believe in global warming. I'm sure he means man-made global warming. Does he know any of you? Uh, but, but let me adjust something that, that uh, James Taylor said earlier. He said, you know, you want to know about the science. Well, here it's represented right here. Well, we're just the tip of the iceberg of numerous and hundreds and even thousands of scientists who uh, feel the same way we do on this issue. And we're just touching a little bit of those facts. And I'm a research scientist. I tend to be very meticulous, analytical, skeptical in everything. And there's a lot of details with this. We're just touching little tidbits here and there. And as I mentioned yesterday, I encourage people to go to the Heartland site. And at the bottom of the heartland.org site, they'll see climate conferences. And they can go to those conferences and see literally hundreds and hundreds of talks by scientists and policymakers getting into much more detail on some of the issues we're uh, discussing here. But there's definitely a lot of scientists. To In fact, I'll just say where I work, I know, I know very few meteorologists that are all alarmed about man-made global warming. I really do, me personally. So I know much more the other way, uh, indeed. So thank you. Yeah, I think that Elon Musk makes a lot of statements about carbon dioxide, and I would be glad to meet him and debate him at any time. One of his, one of his things in the, in the promotion of Tesla is that there's no explanation, no other explanation for the increase in temperatures other than the rise in CO2. Um, I have news for Mr. Musk. There are a great many studies that have been done, correlation, regression analysis, very detailed studies that show that that's not true. There are a lot of natural causes that have been ignored by the climate models and by the people that are presenting in San Francisco as we speak. So I think it's very important to look at that. I think Independent Institute has a bumper sticker called Got Liberty. I would ask that we generate another bumper sticker, Got Science. <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd just like to add, James, that many people think that 97% of scientists agree that we're causing dangerous global warming, and they point to all sorts of studies. But, you know, the interesting thing, the common denominator for these studies that supports, supposedly support that is that they're either not asking the right question, or they're not asking the right people, or they're not asking enough people, or there's method methodological mistakes. And I'll just give an example. There was a paper put out in 2009 by Zimmerman and Doran, 
and this is what they reported. 97% of climate scientists agree, basically, that, and this is not part of the quote, but that the global temperatures have risen and humans are a significant contrib contributing factor. Now, but that's not the question. The question that has to be asked of scientists who specialize in the causes of climate change is, is the kind of climate change we're causing and will cause, will it be dangerous? Okay, now it is interesting that of the science organizations that have issued statements supporting the dangerous anthropogenic global warming theory, um, how many of them do you think are known to have polled their members, the members of the associations, and showed that the majority agreed? Well, the answer is zero, okay? But there are, in fact, many other reports and studies, petitions. The, the biggest one for sure is called the Oregon Petition. Over 31,000 signatures, uh, including over 9,000 PhDs, they all have formal education in fields of specialization that relate to understanding research data on climate. And here's the statement they made, okay? Remember, over 30,000 people signed this. There is no convincing scientific evidence that human release of carbon dioxide, methane, or other greenhouse gases is causing or will in the foreseeable future cause catastrophic heating of the Earth's atmosphere and dis disruption of the Earth's climate system. Moreover, there is substantial scientific evidence that increases in atmospheric carbon dioxide produce many beneficial effects upon the natural plant and animal environments of the Earth. And again, I point people back to the Climate Change Reconsidered site, look up biological impacts, and you'll see a lot of support for that statement. Well, thank you, Tom. And uh, that's a good segue to a topic that we do want to address, and that is the assertion of uh, scientific consensus. As an initial matter, it's important to note that consensus, no matter how overwhelming, if it were to exist, is not the equivalent of scientific proof. It's not the equivalent of scientific evidence. There have been many important scientific theories, uh, many important scientific quote-unquote facts that were later on shown to be false. But nevertheless, it is worth noting that if there is a topic on which the answer is unclear and upon which we must make public policy decisions, then we should certainly look at the scientific evidence and we should, uh, to a certain extent, take into account if there is a large scientific consensus. It doesn't make proof, but it's certainly worth, I will grant, uh, some consideration. But the notion of consensus, and I'll ask somebody to address some of these 97% surveys a little bit more in depth in a moment, and Tom, you brought that up. But I will note that there, there actually has been one scientific organization that did have its members surveyed, not by the organization itself, uh, but by, I believe it was, it might have been Yale 360 which and George Mason University, and they have a, a relatively alarmist bent. But nevertheless, it's very interesting. The American Meteorological Society, of which Stan and Dr. Keene, you have been members, and, uh, and, and Stan note, noted that his colleagues tend to be more skeptic than alarmist. Well, the American Meteorological Society, they have put out a very alarmist statement on global warming. The statement alleges that humans are causing the warming that has occurred, that the results are terrible and will be even worse, and the media has drummed that up to be an overwhelming condemnation by meteorologists across the board against skeptics. But what's very interesting is there have been surveys of the AMS, American Meteorological Society, scientists themselves. It's the only organization by which people have dared to ask the scientists rather than the bureaucracy. Now, what have the scientists said? The most recent survey of AMS meteorologists showed that only half believe that the warming that has occurred is as a net harmful. Only half. And we mentioned earlier today and yesterday the benefits on human mortality, the benefits on human health when temperatures rise, the benefits in crop production, etc. Moreover, according to the AMS surveys, only 30% of meteorologists are very concerned about global warming. That should tell you something. There are a variety of questions, but across the board, what you see is the alarmist positions that we are told the entirety of the world scientists are just about agree on. The agreement is only about 30 to 50 percent. So, Tom, you mentioned how the surveys that have been represented, the 97 percent, do not relate or do not convey the information that the alarmists say it does. 
Yeah. Uh, it, it, if anybody would like to give a little bit more information on that, it's very important to understand what the questions that come up with a 97% consensus, what the questions are and what they are not. Well, yeah, a, a good example is a survey put out by John Cook, an Australian-based blogger. Uh, they looked at the abstracts of peer-reviewed papers published between 1991 and 2011. And the abstract of their paper, analyzing these abstracts, says, among abstracts expressing a position on AGW, that's man-made dangerous climate change, 97.1% endorse the consensus position that humans are causing global warming. Well, of course, the first thing you say is, so what? I mean, it, it, we're not talking about whether we're causing warming, whether it's a t tenth of a degree. What, what the question should have been is, are we causing dangerous global warming that's worth what is now over a billion dollars a day being spent around the world on climate finance? But you know, Mr. Cook's work was debunked anyways. Uh, David Legates, uh, professor of ge geography at the University of Delaware, uh, and three co-authors, he reviewed the same papers as Mr. Cook, and he found this, and this is a direct quote, only 41 papers. 0.3% of all 11,944 abstracts, or 1% of the 4,014 expressing an opinion, not 97.1%, had been found to endorse the claim that human activity is causing most of the current warming. And you know, I direct people to a Wall Street Journal article that was written by Joe Vast, former uh, president of Heartland, and uh, Roy Spencer. And they go through these studies one by one, the 97% claims, and they show that they don't make any sense. They're either method methodologically wrong. Uh, for example, in the case of the Zimmerman one, <laughs> when they finally did their assessment, they only used 79 inputs of the 3,146 people who'd responded to their survey. They had various reasons for eliminating most of them. So yeah, I lo look up that article and you'll see it's taken apart quite well. There's an old saying in sociology that a lie will travel around the world before truth can put its pants on. Mm -hmm. uh, and the alarmist people evidently figure that in these few days here in San Francisco at the Climate Action Summit, that uh, the more lies they tell, the more the world will hear them. Uh, and that may be true, but it is indeed uh, unconscionable. There is no truth being presented at all for the many hours that we on this panel have watched the live streaming of the uh, conference here in San Francisco. Uh, truth is, is absent entirely. You know, one problem with all this with surveys and even in the discussion is the use of, use of terminology. And I get so tired of people in the public being trained that if you say the word climate, that translates in their brain as man-made climate change or man-made global warming. And climate is a big field. I've been dealing with the area of climate almost all of my meteorological career in one way or another, and very little of that has had anything to do with anthropogenic kind of driven climate. And so really AGW is the term we use. That stands for anthropogenic or man-made global warming. Uh, that is not the same as just saying global warming. It's not the same as saying climate change. And just because climate changes and fluctuations happen does not mean we're seeing this anthropogenic-driven uh, change. In fact, if, if someone would ask me, do you believe in climate change, I'd say, of course, the climate's always changing. The climate's always fluctuating. And just because weather disasters happen doesn't prove this kind of stuff. But what people really have to understand, and they're not even talking about AGW, or anthropogenic climate, uh, climate change, or anthropogenic global warming. They're talking about, as some people have said, catastrophic. Because if it's not catastrophic, if it's not going to be death, doom, and destruction, who cares? And there's actually been a lot of quotes out there that they've admitted they have to kind of inflate the impact to get people's attention. I sat, I forgot, I think I mentioned it yesterday, I sat on a panel or listened to a panel discussion where the, the theme was, you know, how do we convey the uncertainty without changing the message? In other words, how do we tell them we really don't know exactly what's going to happen, but we still want to drive home the same thing that we've got to stop carbon dioxide emissions, not carbon emissions. So people have to realize what they're really talking about. And if you would ask many meteorologists, do you think increased carbon emissions could possibly change climate? Most would say yes. Do they think it's dangerous, serious, that we've seen a lot or going to see a lot? That's a whole different ball game. Thank you. Yeah. Along that line, that American Meteorological Society survey, the first question was, is the climate changing? Well, right. yes. It was a 96% positive response. 
And that would include, right. do you believe there was an ice age or a little ice age? Or that the statistics of the past 30 years are different than the statistics of the previous 30 years? Well, they are. But then when you find, you know, get the question in more detail, how much is it changing? What is the cause of it? And ask, is there potentially dangerous anthropogenic global warming going to occur reasonably imminently? Then you get way below 50%. You were quoting, what, about 30%. Right. Yeah, just to give you an indication as to how uncertain the science really is, there are major scientists who say that we're actually headed to global cooling because of what is approaching a grand solar minimum when the sun is forecast to be very weak around 2060. People can look off uh, Professor Abdusemetov at the Polkovo Observatory near St. Petersburg in Russia, and he's given talks actually at Heartland events where he's shown that we're entering into a period of global cooling. So that's the degree of uncertainty. I mean, the, the opinion of scientists is right across the board. There's no certainty whatsoever as to what's going to happen in the future. And I certainly hope the global warming forecasts are wrong for the reasons Jay was saying. We in Canada would certainly lose a great deal if they are in fact true. Let's hope they're wrong. But regardless, that just shows how uncertain we are about the future of Earth's climate. And these same professional societies issue statements to the effect that there is anthropogenic global warming, it is dangerous, uh, generally alarmist statements. The American Meteorological Society issued several of these statements over the past 15, 20 years, and at no point did they survey the membership as to what they thought. They were written by panels and boards up in the leadership at their headquarters in Boston, Massachusetts, and never, never asked the likes of me or other mem or Stan or other members what they thought of that. The survey that they finally did was after these statements. <laughs> and if they'd have read that survey beforehand, hopefully they would have never issued those statements. Yeah, if I can add something to that. I think the, the Cook and the Zimmerman papers, Zimmerman was in 2009, Cook in 2013, um, those two papers never asked the question, as David LeGates underscored in his analysis, never asked the questions about does human emissions cause dangerous temperature increases or dangerous AGW? And the fact of the matter is that they didn't. So if you look at the, if you do the taxonomy, it's a word that, that the summit likes to use, so I'll use it. If you look at the taxonomy of consensus, um, there was an attempt back in the 90s to achieve this, but no one really knew much about global warming or the, or the proposition of AGW. So it really took on, you know, in the first decade of the 2000s, it took on a life uh, of its own with great purpose. If you look at that first decade, 2006, or approximately 2006, is the movie Inconvenient Truth, which tried to sell a, a great many facts that have been since really been reputed. And then soon thereafter, when it was realized that the public was not moving its sympathy towards AGW, they came out with the, the Zimmerman paper. That didn't move the needle, so the Cook paper, and then subsequently move, move into this particular decade after about you know, 2016, when David LeGates and other people refuted uh, that particular uh, claim, and uh, the AMS paper started to ask some, but not all of the right questions. Uh, as far as consensus. Now, you can look at consensus and say, well, wonderful that we have consensus on anything. You know, are the, are the Patriots going to win this weekend in football? I think when you use a consensus to drive the, the words denier and science is settled and a whole bunch of policies which have great economic implications, consensus now is something very different. It puts the world at risk. And one has to look at the origins or the taxonomy of, of these particular claims. And I, even today, there is a website called theconsensusproject.com that puts forth these papers are valid and sufficient. Uh, let me just say that when you use that word consensus, that is so important because science is not done by consensus. There's many times one or two scientists have stood up against the crowd 
and claimed a certain thing and turned out to be true. Not always, but turned out to be true. I've had times in my, lo in my uh, lab where I've had, I mean, we, we have good scientific debate where I work. I mean, <laughs> knock down, drag outs, yelling at each other, you know, challenging each other, iron sharpening iron. But that's how good science works sometimes. Let me add a, a very <laughs> famous <laughs> statement by Albert Einstein. When he came forward with his theory of relativity, uh, there were 100 scientists in uh, Germany that did not believe in him. And uh, he, they wrote a book called 100 Scientists uh, <laughs> Against uh, Einstein's Theory of Relativity. Uh, when Einstein learned of it, he said, why did they need 100? If I'm wrong, it would only take one scientist to disprove me. Well, let me, I'm going to give, I'm going to give a specific example. There was something with a particular hurricane. Very model. quickly, very oh, quickly. Very so quickly. we had other topics. Hur <laughs> hurricane, that's okay, hurricane. <clears throat> well, this is, the issue of consensus is so important because they will say the American Meteorological Society supports this as a consensus. The uh, American Geophysical Union suggests, I mean, they go, and that is not how science works. And, and I had a particular situation with one of our models, and I was questioning the results, and I said, you know, the model is degraded, what's going on, something's wrong. And I had some people yelling at me in my office, you know, you're wrong, it's right for the wrong, all this stuff going on, and I persisted, got to the right person, they checked it, found a mistake, corrected it, and the model just improved dramatically, only because I was willing to stand up against the so-called consensus. Yeah, and and you mentioned these, these organizations that are often cited, and as was pointed out earlier in, in this discussion, these are the statements from the bureaucracy. When the scientists themselves are surveyed, you get a different answer. But even from the bureaucracy, I guess for lack of a better term, there are organizations that, scientific organizations, that alarmists and the media overlook. The American Physical Society, the Polish Academy of Sciences, the Danish National Space Center, the Russian Academy of Science, the Chinese Academy of Sciences. All these organizations have either put out statements contesting the notion that we are creating a catastrophic global warming crisis or noting that there is substantial disagreement among scientists. In other words, refuting the notion that there is a 97% consensus. So to summarize what we discussed here and what our panelists discussed regarding the topic of consensus, I think a, a good way to summarize it is this. When the questions are asked, is the world warming? Have humans played a role? Yes, you get a 97% consensus. Skeptics agree to those points. And it's the alarmists in the media that misrepresent those two questions which are meaningless because skeptics agree with them also. But when the questions are asked, is the warming that's occurred primarily harmful? Are you very concerned about it? These are the questions that drive the debate between skeptics and alarmists. These are the questions that will drive public policy decisions. These are the important questions. And when those are asked of scientists, you get at most a 50-50, 50% of scientists who say that they believe in the alarmist position. That is how you must keep the issue of consensus in mind when it's presented in the media and by alarmists. Now let's move on to another topic. At the Global Climate Action Summit during the past couple days, in addition to hurricanes, there has been a great deal of mention of wildfires. And yesterday, Dr. Gannon here at the Independent Institute uh, addressed that because California, we are told, has been ground zero for wildfires and the Independent Institute here in California. Dr. Gannon is knowledgeable of that and here in residence. But another topic that fuels wildfires, or that would be to blame for wildfires, is the question of drought. Now, even before this wildfire season, the assertion has been made over and over again that because of global warming, global warming is baking the soil and causing more drought. And then from there, you get the implications of wildfires, crop failures, etc. We've already debunked scientifically the notion that global warming is causing more wildfires. We've already debunked the notion that global warming is harming crop in fact. In, in, crop production. In fact, it's doing the opposite. But I would like to ask our panel, specifically regarding drought, the underlying cause of so much concern and so many allegations, what do the scientific data show regarding global warming and, in recent decades, drought? I'll just make two very, very brief points. We had huge droughts in recent years in uh, California and uh, Texas, and everybody, again, was blaming them on uh, global warming. Then there were horrendous rains a year ago in both Texas and uh, California, and that brought uh, the uh, moisture to normal levels. But historically, we know 
that droughts are more prevalent in periods of cold than they are in periods of, uh, of warm. And, uh, and I'll note, does anybody else want to win? Dr. Gannon. Yeah, I mentioned yesterday Modesto, which is a small community on the eastern side. Their, their average rain, I mentioned that yesterday, their average rainfall is 12 inches a year. And they haven't seen really any dramatic change in, in the rainfall for Modesto. What they have seen is a very big change in the amount of water given to them by the state. So I think that there is a good deal of consternation now between the eastern side of California and the western side in terms of the, uh, call it the allocation of water resources. Uh, such things as reservoirs and Mount Lake Shasta and all these things have become very controversial in the state of California. So we have to be aware of, you know, where the water resource is really coming from for a lot of the farmlands. It's not necessarily rainfall. And I think, as Jake said, the idea of oceans being cooler, you know, La Nina, you get less rainfall. I think that's a well-respected and understood term or idea uh, throughout the, pub, you know, throughout the public. And I'll add, uh, Tom, you mentioned the Climate Change Reconsidered series. And if you go to climatechangereconsidered.org, you will see the section on drought that show, shows the scientific data. And in short, let me summarize what the scientific data and the peer-reviewed studies indicate. That is, first of all, during recent decades, there's been no increase in global drought. If anything, there's been a decrease in global drought. Where we have the best evidence is in the United States, where we have a more technologically advanced precipitation and drought monitoring system. And what we see from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, they have data going back more than 100 years. And the data show that drought has become less frequent and less severe during recent years as our planet has moderately warmed. In fact, according to National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration data, it's been nearly 40 years since 40% of the United States has experienced very dry conditions. Now, what's the importance of that? The importance of that is that is the longest period in United States history, at least that we've measured since the 1800s, and it's the longest period by a long shot. If global warming were causing an intensification of drought, we would be seeing more frequent drought and more severe drought. We're seeing just the opposite. In fact, last April, April 2017, only 6% of the United States was experiencing drought conditions. Why is that significant? That is the lowest percentage of the country experiencing drought ever recorded. Again, what we have is empirical data contradicting the assertion that global warming is causing more droughts. One other point I'd like to make, uh, it was mentioned this morning multiple times at the Global Climate Action Summit that we need to be fully funding the Green Climate Fund. And this would put the United States on the hook for billions of dollars each year. Taxpayers would have to pony up at least $100, probably more per household per year to fund it. But what's interesting is it was mentioned earlier by this panel, the greening, Dr. Gannon mentioned the greening of the earth and satellite data has shown a greening of the earth across the board. And, and the tie into the to the green climate fund is this. One of the, they have a web page where they champion their programs and all this is is a slush fund to redistribute money from your pockets to people around the world that are existing and not even people around the world, governments around the world that don't believe in our values and are trying to extort American and Western taxpayers. For example, in Ethiopia, one of the programs they champion, it's a program that they say is designed to help people adapt to the impacts of drought. Well, if you look at the satellite data, what you show is there's been a tremendous greening of Ethiopia. The greening of the world that's occurred uh, across the world as a whole is even more accentuated in, e in Ethiopia. That doesn't occur when there's drought. That occurs when there are more beneficial precipitation patterns, and yet that is being used. The, the allegations of drought are being used as an excuse to extort money from your pockets and give to people where drought is becoming less frequent and severe. I know that there are a couple people that want to weigh in. Let's start with Dr. Keen and then we'll move on. Yeah, I'd like to make a, several comments about droughts. First one is hopefully flippant. I think the last round of severe droughts in California was in the late 1970s. Is that correct? And the response was the governor of uh, the governor was to encourage people to shower with a friend to save water. <laughs> and who was the governor in 1977? Jerry I believe, Brown. I believe it was Jerry Brown. Yeah. So does that mean that the cause of drought in California is Jerry Brown? <laughs> okay. So hopefully get more seriously here, though. What climate effects 
how does climate affect droughts? Well, Jay was saying that it was Jay, right? About yes, cold. It, it, cold. Well, it depends where you are. For example, the great northeast U.S. drought, Philadelphia, New York, New, York, New England, in the early 1960s was a cold period, and there were precipitation shortfalls for several years of 30 to 50 percent, which in area with very regular rainfall, that is a lot. And the impacts were quite severe, like Philadelphia was almost reduced to drinking salt water because the freshwater Delaware was drying up. James brought go out oh, to the, the central <laughs> U.S., Wait to the Great Plains, saying. it tends to be warmer areas, like, for example, the Dust Bowl. That was a hot period, or at least the summers were hot. Now the winters were cold. If you want to go to Colorado, it's more related to El Nino and La Nina, with La Nina being drought, El Nino being rainy or snowy. If you go to Australia, it's El Nino because the tropical rains move out to Tahiti, leaving Australia high and dry. If you go to India, it's also El Nino because the monsoon tends to fail or be very short and dry during mm -hmm. El Nino. So it's very, there's not a, a single solution for drought. But one thing you can probably pretty well say does not influence drought is an increase of 0.2 degrees in the global temperature. Uh, James brought up the uh, Paris Accord and the fact that uh, President Obama uh, actually contributed $500 million to the Green uh, Action Fund, which is uh, a primary part of the Paris Accord. Uh, I've got a few very shocking things to tell the audience about the Paris Accord, which has been talked about constantly in uh, Governor Brown's uh, summit. Their real goal is to get our country back into the Paris Accord. That is absolutely not going to happen. But if we were to sign on to the accord, it says uh, uh, four or five very important things. One is that every country that signs on to the accord can sue the United States if they can show that our carbon dioxide emissions float over their nations. They, the accord also says that any technology that we may develop to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, we must give away freely to uh, every country that is signed on to the accord. It also says that any new technology that we develop in the United States, we must be able to prove that it does not add significant amounts of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And finally, basically, the United States is named as the primary supplier of money to the fund. And that amount was $3 trillion. Uh, President Obama, in the last administration, already contributed $500 million. President Trump uh, has said he will not contribute another penny. And the best news of all, uh, just 10 days ago, the president uh, named a man uh, who will be the primary science advisor within the White House. His name is William Happer. He's one of the he's a professor emeritus of physics at Princeton University. He agrees with all of us on this panel, everything we've said about global warming alarmism. And he's one of the world's leading experts on carbon dioxide. He's right now writing a book about the wonders of carbon dioxide. Everything that people blame carbon dioxide uh, on the negative side is absolutely reversed. It is why we live on this planet. And in fact, the more we pump into the atmosphere, the better life on Earth will be. I think to quote Will Happer, I would say, he says about carbon dioxide, we need more of it. <laughs> yeah, just, just point out one thing. Yesterday, Christine Figueres, who was the previous executive director of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, she said that all nations agreed to Paris and that this, in fact, was great because people were all going to start reducing their emissions. But what people have to realize is that Paris Agreement, like the Kyoto Agreement, like all UN climate agreements, are based on something called the Framework Convention on Climate Change, the FCCC, which was signed in Rio in 1992 by the first President Bush and uh, agreed to by all world leaders. And in that, it sets the ground rules for all future UN treaties on climate. It says in Article 4 that the first and overriding priority for developing countries is poverty alleviation and development, okay? Not greenhouse gas reduction. And mm -hmm. since carbon dioxide is, you know, produced a lot from coal, and China is 80% coal, it's their cheapest source of electricity, India is about 70%, 
when they do get to 2030 and China is supposed to cap their emissions, they, I don't think, have any chance of doing that because they will claim Article 4 gives them an out clause, which it does. It says their first and overriding priority is poverty alleviation and development. And you don't do that by turning off your cheapest form of power, which in this case is coal. So what it boils down to is all of these treaties are, in fact, two treaties, one for us and one for the developing countries. And we can be pretty sure that they will not reduce their emissions based based on that article, that out clause. So, Tom, let's pretend that Article 4 did not exist. Even so, how much is China required to reduce its emissions under the Paris Agreement? Well, under it can increase its emissions as much as it wants until 2030. Okay, that's very different to Western countries who are supposed to start reducing right away. But my point is that beyond 2030, we can't be confident there'll be any reduction well, or restriction. They, they, they pledged that they would attempt to merely plateau their emissions at whatever <laughs> yeah. they are in 2030. Yeah, and you, so, know, you know, James, at the uh, Peru conference, the Chinese negotiator was cornered. And, and it was pointed out, you know, the framework convention, which is the foundation of Paris and these other agreements, has a very different standard for developing and developed countries. Right. And he was asked about that, and he said, well, our purpose is to enforce the Framework Convention, not to change it. So they have a fantastic deal where their competitors in the West are being pulled down with respect to greenhouse gas emissions, and essentially they can go on increasing forever based on this treaty. And Tom, where are China's emissions today? Oh, double that of the U.S. <laughs> so so under, uh, the, under the Paris Agreement, how much is India required to reduce its emissions? I'm not sure, but it's... Uh, the, the answer is not at all. Yeah. And, and, and I guess what I'm getting at is, you, you, you mentioned uh, that Christine Figueres men, you know, talks about how all the nations in the world are in agreement, and it gets to your point. They're, they're two different treaties. Um, it's one treaty, but basically the obligations are much different. You, you know, the James, Western democracies, and particularly the United States, are supposed to, are required to reduce emissions and bear all the pain for doing so. Yet the developing nations, including a very generous definition of developing, including China and India, they're not required to reduce anything. And as you mentioned, what the Paris Agreement does is it saddles the Western democracies, and especially the United States, with restrictions on carbon dioxide emissions, with restrictions on energy usage, with, with restrictions on affordable energy that do not apply to the rest of the world and will never apply to the rest of the world. Why wouldn't <laughs> Every other nation in the world sign on to the Paris Agreement. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, one point I wanted to make, we were talking about the uncertainties in the science and the consensus. I just want to go back one little step, if you don't mind. I mentioned a billion dollars a day being spent on climate finance around the world. People can look that up. There's a group in, in San Francisco called the Climate Policy Initiative, and they actually have analyzed this billion dollars a day. The UN wanted half of it to go to try to stop climate change, the other half to go to helping real people adapt to natural climate variability, which makes sense. As the climate changes, people need help, and that's a natural thing. But because the big money is to be made in mitigation or trying to stop climate change through wind turbines and carbon credit trading, uh, Climate Policy Initiative found that 95% of that billion dollars a day goes to mitigation. The people who need help adapting to natural climate change are only getting 5%. And that is really a crime. I mean, basically, we're saying the, the problems that people are facing today due to natural climate change in certain parts of the world is less important than the possibility of climate change in the distant future. I mean, this is really immoral. So let me ask uh, our panel this. Let us assume for the sake of argument that Donald Trump did not pull out of Paris. Or we can assume for the sake of argument even more so, well, let's go a step further and say that by whatever means the United States agreed to and somehow were able to effectuate an immediate dramatic reduction in carbon dioxide emissions, perhaps even a 100% reduction if it were theoretically possible, as the Global Climate Action Summit is calling for, what would be the impact on global temperatures and global emission trends. And, and let me ask my panel here, uh, what do we know about emission trends, the United States versus the world? What do we know about uh, how temperature would be impacted by changes? The, uh, the, James uh, has a law degree and uh, in, in, in uh, law school, one learns never to ask a question that you don't know the answer to. And uh, <laughs> the answer to that question is, uh, is zero. I mean, there, I would almost argue with uh, one point that's been made by a few people that uh, man does, uh, our emissions of carbon dioxide uh, do have an impact on the temperature of the planet. 
uh, because no one has ever been able to pin it down to a number that is accurate, uh, I choose to actually uh, go to a default uh, number of zero. I, I actually believe our impact on the planet's temperature is zero. Now, we can impact that of a city. We can change the climate of a city. Uh, I remember uh, as a youth, people went to Phoenix for a dry uh, climate if they had asthma or something like that. Then they uh, built 100 or more uh, golf courses and uh, irrigated them all, and the humidity went up, and people don't generally go there anymore for a, uh, a dry climate. So we can change the climate of a very small location. It's only arrogance to think we can change the climate of the world. But to answer again James' question that uh, whatever the emissions uh, were to change among the 192 countries that signed the, uh, the Paris Accord and uh, us and now one other country that has pulled out of the uh, accord, it, it, it makes absolutely uh, no difference at all. And, and they actually admit that. I mean, when you, when you uh, get down to a few comments that have come out of the um, the the meeting of parties when they actually are pinned down to uh, what is the impact of, of what the Paris Accord says on uh, the temperature. Uh, we're getting out to point zero 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 something. It's absolutely meaningless. Yeah, and, you know, concerning the clean power plan, it was interesting when Gina McCarthy, the former uh, executive or um, administrator of the EPA, she was uh, testifying before congressional hearings about the clean power plan, and she was asked about the impact on actual temperatures. And, of course, she danced around the question quite a lot, basically said, well, it's, uh, it's to lead the world. And the reason, it's interesting, the Institute for Energy Research, they speculated after her 24, 2014 hearing, they said the likely reason McCarthy is reticent to discuss the actual effect on climate is because the impact is very small. It turns out if, the, if you use the EPA's magic model, the impact of this rule would reduce the rise in global temperatures by... 0.137 degrees by 2100. <laughs> so <laughs> in Canada, it's even worse. They're talking about a carbon tax that's going to suck $10 billion out of the economy by around 2025. And Pat Michaels did a calculation to figure out what would that do to the world temperature. And again, according to the EPA's model, it was between one and two one thousandths of a degree by 2100 at a cost of over 10 billion in one year. As Tom throws around 2100, remember what Stanley Goldenberg said, we're not sure where Hurricane Florence is going tomorrow. In fact, by the way, since you mentioned Hurricane Florence, let me do a quick update. Because <laughs> it, just, it just really made landfall. But not only that, one of the uh, people online uh, following this uh, mentioned a study which actually is being discussed on the email list I look at uh, by Reed et al. that we find that rainfall will be significantly increased by over 50 percent in the heaviest precipitating parts of the storm. This is specifically human influence on Hurricane Florence and we further find the storm will remain at high category on the Saffir Simpson scale for a longer duration. The storm is approximately 80 kilometers in diameter larger at landfall. Well, saying it and writing it doesn't make it so. And there's plenty of scientific articles out there that they'll do the research, they'll do it in a certain way. There's already people online kind of debating some of this stuff that this person said. But this stuff goes out there in the media and they declare it uh, as long as it goes in that direction uh, that man-made, of course they mean man-made climate change, is making things worse. That's what they want. If, if we say it's going to be fewer hurricanes and not a problem, it's not a headline. They, everything has to be worse uh, for them to be interested in it. Thank you. And, and that's a good summary of the <coughs> arguments that are made. Find anything that you can do that will make global warming look to be human-caused and catastrophic. When you have greater plant growth, you highlight poison ivy rather than maize, wheat, <laughs> rice, etc. But tying, tying back and, I guess, uh, concluding the, the, the segment here about U.S. emissions and global emissions, it's worth noting that since the turn of the century, the United States has reduced carbon dioxide emissions more than any other nation in the world. That's without joining the Kyoto Protocol. That's without signing the Paris Climate Accord. That's without imposing unilaterally a carbon tax on the American citizens. That's without all of the top-down government mandates that are being pushed on the United States. And that's without uh, agreeing to all of the, I guess, 
uh, self criticisms and, and, and self mandates that that President Trump is being chastised for ignoring. We don't necessarily need to sign on to these international climate agreements or government-centered programs if you believe carbon dioxide emissions are a problem. The science indicates it's not, but even if that's the case, the United States is leading the world in carbon dioxide emissions reductions, and yet we are the ones getting beat up on for the problem. In fact, while our emissions have gone down so much, global emissions are up 40% since the turn of the century. If we emitted no carbon dioxide at all, if we had stopped in the year 2000, it would not have mattered because the increase from other nations would have more than compensated for that. Global emissions would still have risen. So when you hear people criticizing Donald Trump, criticizing free markets, criticizing a United States that does not join these international treaties and governance structures, that has nothing to do with carbon dioxide emissions and trends because Quite frankly, we are already doing everything that can be done if you believe it is a crisis, if you believe it's something to be concerned about. Yes, and, and U.S. emissions began to decline during the George Bush administration, I believe. So we can thank George Bush for the beginning of the healing of the earth, <laughs> as a, a later president took credit for. Yeah, and can I just, just clarify something here? Just to get the numbers right, the uh, federal uh, bu parliamentary budget office in Canada's parliament said that the federal carbon tax would suck $10 billion out of Canada's economy by 2022. And so I asked Pat Michaels what would the effect be, and he said uh, one to two one thousandths of a degree by 2100. So that's the original numbers. That's a slight correction. <laughs> Excellent. I I'd like to, I guess, segue into another topic. I mentioned that the reduction in emissions that the United States has achieved has occurred uh, without imposing a carbon dioxide tax, among other measures. And it calls to mind the claims at the Global Climate Action Summit, without any economic data or evidence supporting it, that going or transitioning to wind and solar power alone would save the economy money, would save households money that wind and solar power are cost competitive and indeed cost advantageous versus conventional power. So my question is this, and I guess it's a, it's a multiple uh, faceted question. What are the costs of wind and solar power versus conventional power? How much would it cost American consumers to have this 50% or 100% renewable powered economy? And I guess as a sub point, uh, what would the impact of a carbon dioxide tax be if that were to be imposed? And uh, I guess we can start with uh, with uh, Tom, because I think you've looked at this as well. Uh, is this something you'd like to talk about, or should I turn it over to Dr. Lair? I think Dr. Lair. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Lair. <laughs> the, the wind and solar situation uh, is so uh, amazingly uh, incorrect, uh, and it's being sold to the, the public, and, and it's incorrect on many levels. First of all, Essentially, 50% of the costs that go into building uh, a solar farm or, or wind turbines uh, is supported by state and uh, federal uh, taxes. If those subsidies went away, not only in this country, but pretty much every uh, country in the world, uh, the United Kingdom and uh, Germany particularly, uh, the industries would end overnight. They could not exist if they actually had to spend uh, their own money to build them. But they have a very strong lobby. I predicted uh, eight years ago that the uh, subsidies would end by now. Uh, I was totally wrong, and I really won't predict when they will end because their lobbies are so strong, and they have been able to convince the public that uh, wind and solar are free energy. They're anything but. Uh, they're not even green. We all know that uh, solar farms uh, kill a horrendous number of all kinds of, uh, of birds on a regular basis. We know that wind farms require more. They're not green because the amount of steel and, and mining and minerals and cement that go into building a wind turbine uh, put out far more carbon dioxide uh, than conventional forms of, uh, of energy. But the thing that people really don't understand is that 100% of the output of, uh, of renewable energy, so-called wind and solar, must be backed up by fossil fuel. 
or nuclear power because we all know the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow, we can't let the grid go down. So we have to have power plants either on coal or natural gas or oil operating to throw the switch excuse me and turn them back on full force to make up for the difference of solar and wind so around the world uh there really hasn't been a single decommissioned fossil uh, fuel power plant uh it hasn't been decommissioned because it's replaced by wind and solar they cannot be replaced but to answer james's specific question uh what is the cost structure of moving from uh, fossil fuel to so-called renewable energy, uh, easily tripling energy costs. In California, uh, they're already up uh, 25% because they're calling for uh, long-term 50%. They've just passed legislation saying they want to be 100% renewable by 2045. It's virtually impossible for that to happen, but the costs in California are up 25%. They'll be up 300% if they ever get to 100% renewable energy. Okay, can I just add, add one quick point? Go ahead, Tom. Something that's not brought up very often but should be brought up is the detrimental impact on people that live near industrial wind turbines. They produce something called infrasound, which is low-frequency sound that penetrates buildings and is, is very bad for you. And there is a concern among um, people about the Im impact on children. In fact, in Canada, there's a group called Mothers Against Wind Turbines. Carmen Craw, she's a BSc in pharmacy. Uh, she's the science advisor to, to one of these people here. She wrote in an open communication, she said, vigilance and long-term surveillance systems regarding risks and adverse effects related to children are lacking. Such programs are necessary to evaluate the risk to children who have been exposed to industrial wind turbine. This evaluation should take place before any further turbines are being commissioned. So indeed, you know, if you have a property and you have a 62-story turbine like Shelley Correa had put up near her uh, in West Lincoln, Ontario, I imagine your property value goes pretty low. And these are very serious health detriments to the people who live nearby. Well, the human health detriments are very important, and as Dr. Lair mentioned, there are environmental consequences that are unique to wind and solar power. Wind power in particular uh, requires tremendous amounts of land development. If you're a conservationist, you're going to see many pristine areas of the United States, including some of our most beautiful mountaintop ridges, coastal shorelines, etc., being developed by wind turbines. You're going to have more bird and bat deaths. Peer-reviewed studies show that 1.5 million birds and bats each year are killed in the United States. Uh, from wind turbines. And as Dr. Lair mentioned, the mining, the rare earth minerals that are required for wind turbines, the production, the mining and production of these minerals are among the most toxic and environmentally harmful procedures that are done anywhere in the world. And to have more wind turbines, you have to engage in more rare earth mining. But getting to the point of the economics, I, I guess a question that we can ask is, uh, and this is something we should ask of the renewable power champions when they claim that they're cost competitive, is if wind and solar power are cost competitive, why do you so strongly demand the subsidies that you receive and the renewable power mandates that you have in a majority of states? Because right now, the subsidies for wind power alone are greater than the subsidies for all conventional energy sources combined. The subsidies for solar power alone are greater than the subsidies for all conventional power sources combined. And the answer is, according to the Brookings Institution, which is a left-of-center think tank, uh, they looked at the levelized cost of various energy sources. They found that converting to wind power increases, ener increases energy cost 50 percent. Converting to solar power triples con uh, current energy prices. That's coming from a left-of-center think tank. When the assertion is that we can switch to wind and solar power and save the economy money, well, why aren't we doing it without government mandates? Why do you need these subsidies? And the answer, I believe, is self-apparent. You, you know, many uh, environmentalists who really understand this realize the impact of birds on birds and bats. And there's a site that people should go to. It's called Save the Eagles International. Okay, so, I mean, real environmentalists should not be supporting something that kills endangered species in the case of uh, golden eagles and things like that. So go to Save the Eagles International. It's a group out of Spain who are vehemently opposed to wind turbines because of the deaths on birds. Excellent. Thank you. And Dr. Gannon, I think you're looking to weigh in. Yeah, I'm going to weigh in. <laughs> I think, you know, uh, taking a slightly different slant on this, because I think you can see, you know, some of the numbers and some of the feelings on different aspects of renewables, et cetera, is that you have to ask the question, 
what's the best way to go forward? Is, is really our best way forward is to promote the best sound technological advancement. And I think we've seen that in Silicon Valley for the most part up until recently, where you have you know, the computer science industry benefiting from a highly capitalistic, innovative society. There weren't any winners or losers picked early in that process, and I lived through that process. But what we're seeing now, even in the Obama administration, where winners and losers were picked, you can ask the question, there's very little literature on this, on this particular question, you can ask the question, is that thwarting the free market? Now the free market is where you have the free exchange and testing out of ideas and the, and the promotion of new technologies that are sound economically and they're sound socially because they're fully tested. But now what we're seeing is, as we just heard, and there's much more on, on online and in various publications, what you end up seeing is that the winners and losers are picked early. Now, what that in, in, de what that in effect really happens, uh, what that occurs or causes, is a, is a distortion in the marketplace. And so what we're witnessing is the thwarting of new developments in a way that is very subtle but very real. And I think that's an important element in all of this discussion. And, and really tying this together, it's important to note that when people such as Dr. Gannon mentioned the economics and the high costs of, uh, of other energy sources and impeding the free market, it's not for Scrooge McDuck love of money. It's because we're concerned about human health and welfare. And wealthier households, wealthier societies are able to afford better housing, better nutrition, better education, better health care. And all the things that make life healthier, happier, more enjoyable. And that's ultimately what we're looking for is the betterment of the human condition. Now, as we wind down, we have about 10 minutes left. I want to hit one more hard science topic, and I'll bring in Stan to start on this. One of the global warming topics that's frequently mentioned, and particularly in your neck of the woods in South Florida, is sea level rise. And I don't want to do what I'm often accused of or skeptics are accused of putting your head in the sand or denying everything for the sake of denial. But it does seem to reason that if temperatures rise, we're going to have some increase in sea level. Can you address the assertions that this is an imminent catastrophe that justifies severe restrictions on carbon dioxide emissions? First of all, I have to comment on someone's uh, mentioning online how we're just lying with a straight face. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we can certainly say that about the other side. All of us are basing this on, on careful research and looking at the data. And uh, this is what we really feel scientifically. Uh, but as far as sea level rise, I have to be very careful to address areas that are in my area of expertise. I'm not trying to go all over the place. I'm not an expert on sea level rise, but I know that there's no reputable study that shows substantial sea level rises happening now. Sure, you have the oceans warm, they expand, you have land subsidence, you have all sorts of issues uh, dealing with that. But the image that Al Gore gives at the end of Inconvenient Truth showing 10 to 20 feet sea level. I mean, that's a, I, I call his movie a comedy movie for meteorologists. Uh, there's no reputable uh, study that would support that at all. But as I said before, they have to make things catastrophic, catastrophic, catastrophic uh, to get people's attention. And they're the ones who diverge from uh, reality. So I'm going to let uh, well, someone Stan, else who might yeah, be able uh, to articulate that. Stan, there, there are, in fact, some very reputable studies showing that sea level uh, is not uh, rising on a planetary basis. There's a 10-city study uh, done on 10 coastal cities over the last 100 years tracking uh, sea level against carbon dioxide emissions, and they know there is no relationship uh, whatsoever between the increase in carbon dioxide, the increase in uh, sea level. Uh, also, everywhere that uh, we've tracked sea level near stable land masses, land actually can go up and go down, but in areas where the land elevation was stable and they measured sea level, uh, over the last 100 years in direct measurement, uh, they've found that the ocean level is rising six inches per, se per century, and we can go back 800 years with uh, proxy measurements of water levels all over the uh, planet where we know what the water level was uh, many hundreds 
hundreds of years ago. And uh, we know that six to seven inches a century has been constant for the last 800 years. Uh, there's an area uh, in the Pacific, the Mariana Islands. Uh, there are about 87 islands there that people thought uh, were uh, becoming submerged. In fact, the opposite has uh, been the case over the last 50 years. The land mass of the Mariana Islands has increased, meaning obviously either sea level went down or the land uh, uh, went up. But the poster child for a sea level rise is an island called uh, Tuvalu that was uh, thought we would have global warming uh, immigrants that would have to be saved. They'd have to move uh, off uh, the island and they had no resources at all. And in fact, we found the opposite is true, that the uh, either sea level went down or the land mass has gone up. So all of the actual critical study uh, evidence supports uh, no excessive increase in sea level rise. And of course, going back to Al Gore's ridiculous movie uh, where uh, the oceans were going to swamp Manhattan Island, uh, it's absolutely absurd. Uh, there is no evidence at all. Let, let me just mention one other thing. When I uh, read yesterday the 1922 Monthly Weather Review article, which people can look up uh, online or contact me, and it talked about how incredible the warming was back then and much of the polar ice caps were disappearing. All, all this stuff was happening. Florida did not go underwater at that time. I, I, <laughs> I believe that is the case. It went a little bit underwater in 1926. <laughs> that was because of the great <laughs> Miami hurricane. Uh, but it did not go underwater from sea level rise because they're saying when this ice melts, you know, everything's going to go underwater. Yeah, I think if I can add something to that, I think uh, certainly, and you can verify this, Stan, I think Miami is falling geologically, sinking faster than the Substance, sea is rising. Yes. So I think, you know, the earth is very active geologically, and we're seeing signs that the western side of Antarctica is rising because of activity geologically. I think the other thing that's rather interesting is to look at the satellite measurements of ocean, which has come online in the last few decades, and to compare satellite to satellite, as Willie Soon has done, shows a, a significant accuracy problem uh, in, in how this is normalized or homogenized is of great controversy, even within the skeptical community, but certainly in the greater community. And I think what we're seeing is that there's sea level data out there that has been adjusted from being flat to actually showing a significant increase in sea level. So this is, this is taking on, again, the, the smearing of science and data with the narrative and politics. As and you have places like New Orleans where normally the sediment coming down the Mississippi overflows the delta raises the land level, but then it compresses, the silt compresses, so it's pretty stable over thousands of years. So the Mississippi Delta itself is not going anywhere. However, New Orleans has levees around it that keeps the setting. You know, of course, people don't want silt flooding their streets, so all they see is the compression of the sediment and the relative sinking of the city. So New Orleans is lower, so if from a street-side perspective in New Orleans, sea level is going up quite quickly. As uh, Since this whole meeting uh, is about carbon dioxide and there are six of us here, uh, you want to accuse us of spewing hot air, we'll have to <laughs> say we're guilty of that. The carbon dioxide level uh, around this table in a relatively small room is now 1,100. I'm willing to bet that at the climate summit it's over 2,000. You don't see any of uh, scurrying away uh, fearful. It's not a problem. We exhale 10 times the amount uh, that you find in the outside atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is nothing to be feared. The more, uh, the better of it. And uh, as I've said yesterday on submarines, uh, mm -hmm. underwater for a month at a time, a nuclear sub, it uh, averages over 5,000 parts per million. So if you're afraid of carbon dioxide, now's the time to end that fear. And, and by the way, going back to one quantitative statement I'll say quickly about the sea level rise. Uh, I wrote this for an article by Cal Beisner and Dr. Neil Frank. Dr. Neil Frank, former director of the National Hurricane Center. I encourage people, go look up Neil Frank on YouTube, Global Warming. He has a terrific talk there. But basically, people were blaming Hurricane Sandy devastation on sea level rise. And basically, the total sea level rise since the great 1938 New England hurricane is only about seven inches, seven inches in all those years, and only about half of that 
uh, was due to sea level rise. The rest was due to, as others have mentioned, land, su land subsidence. That's a lot less than the whole storm surge that we were dealing with. And we have so many eager panel participants, <laughs> but we are reaching our deadline. Uh, let me just summarize what Dr. Lair said or put it in perspective. The argument is often made that carbon dioxide is pollution. If carbon dioxide is pollution, the EPA would never allow us to be in this room with carbon dioxide levels so much higher than ambient <laughs> levels outside, nor would they allow the Global Climate Action Summit to exist either because their levels are even higher. Carbon dioxide is not a pollutant. It doesn't cause human health harms, nor, as this panel has shown, and just a tip of the iceberg of the scientists and scientific evidence supporting uh, this, is that nor does carbon dioxide bring about a climate apocalypse, nor does it show any signs of doing so. To wrap it up, I'd just like to point out that at the Global Climate Action Summit and across the alarmist universe, you see very little science presented. That which is presented is never encouraged or invited to be held up for scrutiny, for discussion or debate. But on the other hand, we do so. The National Science Teachers Association said that we must not engage in this debate for ideological or political reasons. Instead, any such theories or assertions must stand up to existing empirical evidence and empirical testing. At the Heartland Institute, at the Independent Institute, and at the many public policy organizations that are skeptical of a climate crisis, among the thousands of scientists who are skeptical of the alleged impending climate crisis, this is what we do. We stand up for sound science, we present evidence, we present data to support what we are asserting. Any time that we make the claims that we are not facing a climate crisis, check out what supports what we're saying. Because if we don't support it with scientific evidence, don't believe it. But we do, and we do it much more than the other side. With that, I'd like to thank our panel, Tom Harris, Dr. Richard Keen, Stan Goldenberg, Dr. Terry Gannon, Jay Lair, I'm James Taylor. Always check the sources. Thank you very much for watching and have a fantastic weekend.